folks, it's E-Chip out here in the shop and today I thought I would do something a little out of the ordinary. It's not really, doesn't really fit our um, purpose with the contentment channel, but I had to get this done. I thought this might be a fun video that might be of help to somebody somewhere, sometime, I don't know. This is a 14-inch uh, Rikon bandsaw and uh, it was given to me a number of years ago for my birthday. My kids gave it to me. I've used it a little bit, but I've not really been able to use it to its full potential. But it hasn't been a very good bandsaw for resawing, and I need to find out why. It's time to tune this thing up, change out the blade, do some work on the belt, um, generally clean it up and spruce it up for the woodworking season. So I thought I'd take you along the way, and let's see if we can get this thing into shape so that we can do some resawing. Let me give you a little tour of the uh, bandsaws and familiarize with them. For those of you who are not familiar with bandsaws, um, furniture makers love these things because they allow you to cut curves, resaw wood, and do other things so you can get custom sizes, custom shapes out of wood, and uh, build some really nice furniture. There are certain, you know, furniture makers, custom furniture makers, where this is their go-to tool. Um, unlike, you know, a table saw, a bandsaw would be their first choice. Phil Maloof was a furniture maker, built, uh, was famous for building these really cool rocking chairs. Uh, and this was his go-to tool. And um, so, I mean, they, they, they're they a really cool tool if you can get them to work right. <laughs> I haven't always been able to get this thing to work the way I want it to. So that's part of my tearing into this thing and see what we can do. But this is a 14 inch bandsaw. And the way you measure this is, uh, the way a bandsaw is measured is from the table to the top of this carriage, and this is adjustable, it'll come up here. The maximum height of your cut is 14 inches. That's where that comes from. It's this, they call the throat. And then, uh, of course, a bandsaw is nothing more than a, than a blade that spins continuously uh, through the machine. The, you can see, here's the bandsaw blade, and as you can see, it has teeth on one side, it's smooth on the other, and this goes only in one direction, this direction. As it goes, you feed wood through it, and it cuts it, obviously. Now, the blade is operated, is spun, by two very large wheels. They're made of cast iron, and they're very heavy. And they work on the same principle as a flywheel. Because they're heavy, once they get to spinning, they create a momentum uh, which aids in cutting and spinning that uh, that blade and cutting the wood more efficiently than just using motor power alone. And that means when you stop the machine that that blade will continue to spin for some time on its own momentum. But uh, yeah, uh, you can uh, adjust the, the uh, tension of the blade by moving this wheel up and down. There's an adjustment screw up there you can see to do that. You can also adjust the speed of the blade by moving this belt uh, either to the smaller pulley or the larger pulley and uh, so and then obviously you can change out the blades um, there are different size blades that you can get for a bandsaw some with more teeth per inch than others and those are for different purposes um, and so what I need to do is get in here clean this out uh, you know put a new blade in do some adjustment to the guides here uh, that guide the blade and then let's uh let's see if we can resaw a nice hard piece of hickory let's see how that goes thought I would get a close look at it, inspect it. I don't know if that shows up or not, but you can see the edges of the uh, teeth are very shiny. The uh, the blade's wearing down. It still has some sharpness to it. Um, there doesn't appear to be any dullness, but um, it's gotten used. And uh, so we're going to change that out. We can actually sharpen uh, blades and reinstall them. 
I'm not going to do that today, but let me see how many blades are known by the number of teeth they have per inch. This one, I don't remember, is, uh, let's see, we got uh, one, two, three, four, about five teeth per inch on this one. This is, so this would be used for fine work. I can't remember the last thing I did on this. Uh, fine cutting and uh, you know where you're where you've got some uh, maybe some good curves uh, but you want a really nice cut and there's some kind of I don't know if it's a painter oh I know I was cutting some plastic on this I want to get some plastic cut there's a little bit of plastic on here this will clean up with say some simple green uh, cleaner just let it soak a while scrub it down and then you can actually sharpen these teeth and reuse this blade so that's what we'll do the uh, next thing we'll, to do will be to remove these wheels and uh, clean off back there a little bit. We'll do that next. It's work, 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 work. What is? This. There we go. You could put it on your head <laughs> and have um, a point of view. I don't know. Oh, baby. Sweaty and hot and muddy. <laughs> oh, I'm dead on my head. Oh, no. Not comfy. What's up with this Does this show up? No, no. All right, so next thing I'm doing is inspecting the tires on these. These tires are replaceable. They're just a, I don't know, like a nylon or, you know, something like that. They provide a little friction surface for the belt to ride against and a little bit of cushioning. Um, yeah, check the tires to see if stuff's embedded in them that could be tearing up the blade. It can't hurt to go over them, and I think I will go over them, with a little bit of fine sandpaper uh, to rough them up a little bit and to get some of this garbage off that's on them. And we'll clean them up that way before we put them back in. So, that's what we'll do. It's very dusty and sawdusty. Yeah. A good job. Pieces. Better than those. Definitely need to be cleaned up. My floor. <laughs> You're mesh on my floor. I'm looking at the belt on this, and this thing is just chewed up. There's all kinds of stuff in it. The edge of it is chewed. It's time for a new belt. Uh, I think I have one. Uh, there may have been an extra that came with the saw originally, but this is the original belt, and I've had this thing for years. Um, Definitely time to change it out. Cleaning out these gears a little bit, uh, this pinion worm gear, um, <clears throat> they fill up, they're, they're usually greased with something like a white lithium grease or something like that, some kind of stiff grease, nothing that's really gooey. But uh, you know, you do your best to clean them up. They're going to fill up with sawdust again. You'd be surprised how well sawdust and grease get along. But uh, I'll just clean them up a little bit as best I can. Now I'll also grease these teeth back here. Uh, along this uh, this guy. Check the action and make sure everything's moving smoothly. Okay, so I have a sanding block and a little bit of 220 grit paper on it. I'm just gonna 
running over these. I'm not, I'm not really going to take digs at it. I just want to clean them up a little bit. They don't have to be pretty. Anything, just get the big stuff off. Anything that may be stuck to it, I don't have to get crazy on it. And this provides, you know, roughs things up and provides a little bit of friction to uh, help the, the saw blade move across it or move along it. And sanding it, roughing it up like this provides a little bit of bite to help the saw. Babe, are you just going to dust the wheel off? Yeah, just dust it off. And, uh, just take my hand and brush here and do stuff this sort of soda. Clean it up. So. Although the belt, you know, that should be sanded a little bit. Uh, the um, the tire. Does it go in the top? Yep. my own sanding blocks this is just a piece of pine with a 1 8 inch piece of cork glued to it the cork provides enough of a cushion for a, a nice sanding uh, surface and uh, I just wrap paper around and go with it it worked really well a lot better than the sanding blocks you buy in the store you know the ones that are cushiony uh, having a sanding block just a tiny bit of cushion, but that's really firm. I think it's best for sanding a lot of stuff, unless it's a molding or something. So as you can see, the color difference. See, I'm just sort of cleaning it up here, a little darker here where I haven't done yet. Nothing fancy, nothing big. Just clean that little piece of brass in here. A while back, I was had a project where I was cutting brass. You can actually cut brass on a uh, bandsaw it's soft enough and it won't do that much damage to the uh, teeth can handle it normally because uh, it's such soft metal got a little piece of brass embedded in the wheel and the uh, tire what did you make with brass uh, i built a folding chair for my daughter and it involved <laughs> brass uh, fittings like brass hardware so i had to custom cut some brass hardware and shape it so it would go in here some more so it would uh, um for you know a lot of things furniture particularly outdoor furniture or something like that folding chairs things like that uh, bronze bushings and bronze or brass fittings uh, brass fittings are often good uh, particularly if they're going to be used outside or be used a lot or something like that those uh Bushings and parts and stuff seem to hold up much better. And by the way, almost all the sawdust you see in this shop goes to composting. We use it for the garden, compost our kitchen waste, and uh, stuff like that. One of the beauties of a bandsaw is that it allows you to cut compound curves, compound um, angles, uh, things like that. And uh, so that's, that's why this table tilts. So it's kind of cool that way. But that allows me to get in here and clean that up. And this uh, little gear assembly here is called a trunnion. This trunnion uh, is made out of cast aluminum. Uh, most of the parts you know, don't require any grease, but a few do. So let's spray some right there where they go. It's a little throat plate here. It uh, has holes in it to allow for suction from the, um, you, you can hook up a vacuum system to this and it will suck down a lot of the uh, sawdust. This one doesn't have a very good vacuum system, doesn't get it all. But uh, as you can see, this throat plate has become a little worn. It got cut one time. I think uh, the blade tended to travel and it, you know, chewed up the throat plate a little bit. I have four, actually. 
uh, replacement throat plates for this. And uh, so um, I'll go ahead and throw it in. So it fits in there like that. Before I put it in, I'm going to go ahead and clean up this uh, table really well, give it a good polish. When I clean my um, cast iron surfaces like this and machine surfaces, um, depends on how what kind of shape they're in as to you know what I'll use. This table is in really good condition. There's no rust or anything on it. So I'll normally just go over it with a little bit of oil and a Scotch Brite pad, like a scrubby pad, and just rub it in real good. Go with the grain of the uh, metal, and you'll see it on there. It's like stainless steel or something. This isn't stainless steel, but you'll see a grain similar to it. Just like sanding, go with the grain, and um, you know, just scrub it really good, and be ready with a cloth, you know, to wipe it um, when it's when you're done. So, so you can see your progress as you go. As you can see, I don't know if the camera will show up, but that shows this is noticeably brighter than this. It might be the camera angle that's fooling or something if you can't see it. But um, that's that's how I do it. Do it scratch by fine steel wool, whatever. You can also use a product called Never Dull if it's in, like I said, if it's in good shape and there are no problems with it, uh, you can use Never Dull and just rub it on in the same way as just a little wad of wool that's um, got some oily stuff in it that breaks down rust and stuff like that. Rub it in just like you would, you know, with steel wool or whatever, petroleum based product in it and uh, it just uh, cleans it up once you got it where you want it you can wipe it down and with this stuff you want to wipe it down unlike the oil you need to wipe this down right away or it will set up in there <laughs> and uh, you, you'll have to do it all over again this includes um, cleaning out your t-track as best you can this t-track is you know things glide along it too that require and it requires a nice smooth uh, you know clean surface so it doesn't get hung up when your fence or you know whatever is in here it needs to be able to glide smoothly it should also be polished if you've got stubborn uh, something stubborn on there like I do maybe a piece of dried glue or something like that um, and you have to be careful about this, but I find that using a very sharp knife to scrape it, similar to how you would clean a, um, a kitchen, you know, one of those new glass tops on the kitchen stoves, uh, it works fine. And I don't know why that shows up on camera, but, you know, just a nice clean surface. It doesn't have to be kitchen clean. You know, this is a working surface for wood. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be polished stainless steel, although we are going to polish it. Um, you know, so. Okay, and then the last step would be a little bit of paste wax. Just uh, rub it in. Really well. I'm using a microfiber chamois for this, just like I would if I were, you know, polishing a car or something like that. And uh, just get it in there really good. Scrub it, rub it in. Make sure it gets into the, you know, in between the little high spots in there. You know, the grain, it sort of levels it out. That's what a polish does. Sort of levels, fills in the pores, levels things out. Makes a nice, uh, let it set up and dry. It's mostly dry now. And just polish it in. I'm going to buff it in well. It's like... Just like waxing a car. You know, that feeling you get uh, that, you know, the finish on the car, how smooth and glass-like it is, and how your cloth just glides across it, you know, when you're done polishing your car. Same thing here. And uh, that's exactly what you're aiming for, because when you're cutting wood, you want to remove as much friction um, for the wood as you possibly can. So, um, you know, when you're pushing stock through on a table, make sure the table is clean, smooth, and glides beautifully, and you'll have a much, 
nicer experience uh, doing woodworking. It takes a little work. You know, this doesn't really take as long as I'm making it look in this video. It just takes a few minutes whenever you get around to it. At least that's how it is for me. I don't schedule this stuff. But, uh, you know, whenever it looks like it needs it, I just come hit it. And obviously, you want to keep a cast iron top like this. This isn't stainless steel. Um, away from moisture and things like that so that it doesn't rust out. It looks like there's one spot here where I can see a little bit of pitting from rust. It's happened. But, uh, you know, if you just get in there right away, uh, the thing you want to do the moment you see it is to dry it, clean it off as best you can. Then hit it with some kind of uh, anti-rust or oil uh, or something like that. Scrub it with that scrubby like I showed you. scotch Bright scrubber. And, uh, you know, then as soon as you can, go back and give the, uh, give the top a good polish. You can also rub it down if the, because the longer the rust sits there, the worse the pitting will get. I know you think you've dried it and should be okay, but no. Once that oxidation starts, it grows, even when you don't think there's any moisture. Uh, but humidity will start it and do it too. So, you know, you wanna protect this stuff, you know, protect the tabletop. It will, uh, you know, whether it be a table saw or a band saw top, a planer top, anything with cast iron, it'll take good care of you. And uh, give you many good, I wish this were big enough to glide this across so you can see how, see how smooth it is. But uh, yeah, take good care of you. So. And you want this surface even or just proud, uh, just sticking up just a tiny bit from this one, so that when you push wood through here, it doesn't get hung up on the metal part here. That's, uh, that's important. So one of the frustrations I've had with this bandsaw is the dust collection. The, um, as you can see, here's the dust collection port inside of the case. The idea is that it sucks, you know, the uh, sawdust down as the blade rolls through here and sucks it down comes in here and then you know this port sort of sucks it up and out on that side okay the problem is and these things are known this particular model and this age known for this problem they installed this little baffle here which blocks so much airflow that the dust collection is dismal in this machine and you saw at the beginning how much I vacuumed out and then I you know, did that regular, regularly. So uh, it's time to remove this baffle. The newer models, which are, you know, pretty much the same machine with a few changes, have this baffle, uh, do not have a baffle in place here. And so I am going to remove this baffle and uh, see if we can get better dust collection out of this thing. Handy dandy little Dremel. I don't have very much cutting uh, surface left on this little wheel. We'll see if I have enough. Oh, I have to go get some more. cutting wheel <laughs> don't know how easy it's going to be to get this thing in there but I got to break out the bigger guns because I'm out of cutting wheels uh, on the Dremel so let's try this and that took care of that That should give us better vacuum. Okay, so we've got the new bandsaw blade installed back there, and we'll just test it. It works. It appears fine. Now it's time to install the new 
blade. This blade is uh, three TPI, three teeth per inch. And uh, that's important because the thickness of the wood I want to cut with it is very thick and I want to try some resawing. So what you want is a bandsaw blade that has as few teeth per inch as possible so it can carry that, uh, that, uh, that uh, sawdust and stuff away quickly and saw right through the wood. So remember with any blade, the more teeth you have on it, the finer the cut and the more work the saw has to do and the more heat involved in getting it done. Uh, the fewer teeth you have, the coarser the cut, the faster it goes and uh, the less heat you have. So here we go. I wanna make sure when you install this, that you <laughs> install it with the blade, the teeth facing you and point it downward so that they cut the wood. Set it over the tires, run it through the guides. Get through all the little cracks and things you need to. <clears throat> it's like threading a needle. Yeah, sort of like a sewing machine. Set up a sewing machine, I guess. Huh? Okay, and lower this a little so we can get the blade on. This creates a blade tension. Lower the wheel. Loosens the blade so we can scoot it on over the tires. And then get lined up best we can. And tighten it back up. And when you're cutting wood, you want to make sure that you're stack here is as close to the material as you can get so we provide the maximum amount of support. You see I'm blade. shining the light in there and you see that that blade is sitting right on the tire. There is a way to adjust that in case it tends to wander one side to the other and and uh, we'll do that right now. We'll turn this on and we'll test it. As you can see I can adjust the position of the blade by adjusting the angle of the wheel a little bit. Probably want it right about center and I'll just tighten it in that position. <clears throat> nice and centered on the tires. Be good to go. You know, for some reason or another, one of the things I never did when I got this on, I just kept it knowing I was going to do it someday. I never installed the measuring tape uh, on this that tells me the distance that this fence is from the inside of the blade. And so I'll take advantage of this time and do it right now. The way you do it is you take this fence and you roll it right up against the blade till it stops without without distorting the blade okay and then you uh, find out where it stops line up this zero mark on the tape with the marker or the edge of the fence and now you'll know once I uh, stick this down You'll know that when, I'll know that whenever the fence is against the blade, I'm at zero, and I can accurately measure the distance of the fence from the blade from that point. Five inches, four or five inches, you know, all that good stuff. Bandsaw blades, um, I'm sorry, fences, and uh, blades and bandsaws in general are really not all that accurate cutters. Um, these are measured in eighths of an inch, not sixteenths or thirty seconds because they're generally a coarse cut. Um, but it gets you there. It gets you close enough for most of the work you need to do with the bandsaw. We've got our zero mark set. I'm going to hold the tape down flat where it needs to be and set this tape right there where it's glued on. Now I know it won't move. Or at least I hope it won't. And I can continue to run the tape off get where I want it
what, if it's not exact and perfect, that's okay. Because bandsaw cuts, like I said, generally are fairly coarse and primary cuts anyway. Not finished cuts. But hey, we're pretty darn close. Looking good. <clears throat> Should we try to cut some wood with it, Rob? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm going to try to resaw a uh, piece of poplar that I've got here. Resawing is where you take the wood on edge like that and cut it to give you two thinner pieces. And uh, that's one of the beauties of a bandsaw is that you're supposed to be able to do that. Well, I really haven't been able to do this much because the bandsaw has just never worked that well for me uh, doing resawing. But we're going to try it see what we get. Here we go. <clears throat> this is a piece of poplar. It appears I have my blade guy a little too close to the action. adjust this back a little bit. How'd we do, Robert? I don't know. Let's see. Ta-da! That looks I did good. a good job. Boy, it's about time. I've had so much trouble trying to get this thing to resaw. And uh, so that's good news. That means we get on with our prize project and other things. So, very nice. Thank you.